everyone to the CoinSpot launch pad. I'm Felicity Thomas, uh, one of the co-hosts of Talk Money to Me podcast. So a big thank you to CoinSpot, who are major sponsors of our FinFest event. Our next guest really needs no introduction. Uh, we have Scott Phillips, the C Chief Investment Officer of Motley Fool. And I've got to admit, I really do love Motley Fool, so I'm very excited to be emceeing you today. Now, Scott, as you know, has plenty of experience in investing, um, having been through a number of market cycles. In this session, he's really going to help you make sense of what's going on and give you insight into some of his investment ideas, which we all like. So the name of this session is Top Tricks to Help You Navigate the Current Climate. Just what we always do, our general disclaimer, um, all the information presented today is for education and entertainment purposes. Any advice is general advice and it does not take into account your personal circumstances, needs or objectives. Before acting on general advice, you should consider whether it's relevant to you um, and read the PDF. And if you're unsure, please speak to a financial professional. Equity Makes Media now has their own AFSL, which is very exciting. The number is 540697. So please welcome Scott. Noise in the background, I'm my level best to be heard. Lucky you got the earphones on. If you can't hear me, please press, please put your hand up and yell, and I will help you out. Now, I'm the Motley Fool's Chief Investment Officer. You know who the Motley Fool is? You know how you know? Because equity basically has been making fun of us for years. So if you've seen their social media posts, the next after pay, anybody? Anybody? Yes, that's us. Uh, I don't do the marketing, no, I can neither take the credit nor the blame. Uh, all I know is that it works. And unfortunately, for our purposes, for as long as it does work, you'll probably keep seeing it there or thereabouts. Now, this is a tough time to be an investor. Who here owns shares? Everybody? Good. Who here owns tech shares? Growth shares? Who owns tech shares or growth that's gone up in the last 12 months? One. One down here, that's pretty good. It's been a really, really tough time to be an investor over the last 12 or 18 months. The message I have for you is I've been doing this for a very long time. First as a student, then as a private investor, then as a professional investor, and then as a multi pool. And the reality is, this is not unusual. This is not a bug, this is a feature. That's not great. It doesn't make anybody happy. Nobody likes to lose money. But I want to remind you of the long-term value creation of the stock market. Does anyone know the best performing stock market in the world over the last 120 years? Anyone want to guess? Interactive, anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? That's a joke for the old people in the room. You guys won't get that. Uh, it was the ASX. Hit the US market by that much. Over 120 years, so it is 6.1% after inflation. Call that 85 9% depending on what the inflation rate was over that period of time. The number one market was the ASX. Now, over that 120 plus years, we had two world wars. A war in Vietnam, Korea, Malaya. Two Gulf Wars. We had terrorist attacks in New York and in Bali. Great anniversary just recently. We have been in a market that has had oil shocks. Guess what? The sort of inflation we're having now is not you. We just haven't had it for a while. The sort of interest rate environment we're in now is not you. We just haven't had it for a while. This is common. This is not unusual. Why it feels unusual is because this is not the new normal. This is the old normal. We had a break for 20 years, maybe 30 years. While inflation stayed low, interest rates didn't do much, everything felt great. Tech stocks are down by a lot over the last 18 months. And down a lot over the last 18 months on the back of the market repricing risk, repricing growth, and repricing companies that don't make any money. Does that sound familiar? No, it won't. You're all too young. That was the dot-com crash. 23 years ago. Horrible, 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 horrible crash. Except for one thing. Over the last 30 years, $10,000 invested in the US stock market on the 30th of June, 1992, 10 grand, was worth $180,000 30 years later. I say that slowly and deliberately because you've got to take this in. Don't just hear it. Listen to it, lock it in there somewhere. I've 
go ahead and think he's getting from late. You guys have to work a little bit harder to get that in. Ten grand, 30 years ago. $180,000 30 years later. What do you have to do for that money? Nothing. Not almost nothing. Not even nothing difficult. You literally had to do nothing. You had to leave it alone. That's the nothing that you have to do. That's trick number one. It's patience bordering on sloth. You have to learn to do nothing. If you did something for that money through that 30 year period, it didn't compound from 10 grand to 180 grand. You had to put it in the market, then you had to take your grubby little hands off the money. Don't respond, don't react to the crisis, the dot com crash, the Asian financial crisis. No one remembers that anymore because it was so far ago. 1997, Asian currency crisis, dot com crash, New York bombing, Bali bombing, GFC, COVID crash. 30 years over that period of time in the US, 10 grand, now with 180 grand. In Australia, by the way, that's now worth $130,000. Not quite as good as the US, sorry, but still remarkable. A 13 fold gain in your money by leaving your money alone. Patience. Don't react. Don't overreact, but don't react at all. Let time do its thing. Tip number two. I'm going to call this know what you own. And know what you own doesn't mean memorizing the stocks that are in your portfolio. Now, our current Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, was in trouble during the election campaign because he couldn't remember the six talking points of his aged care policy. You guys remember that? Big hullabaloo? I made a point on Twitter. I said, I couldn't name to you in order my top five holdings. And a couple of people got up me and said, I'll probably play the liberal supporters, got up me and said, how could you not know? I said, I don't need to know. Of all things I need to do with my head in the course of a day, week, month, and year as an investor, memorizing my portfolio is not one of them. Now, I probably could have had a reasonable guess at the top five. I might have even got it right. If not, I was probably close. My point was, memorizing stuff does not make you a good politician for what it's worth. It doesn't make you a good investor. So when I say know what you own, I'm not saying name the stocks that you own. Be able to recite the code. None of that stuff. Know what you own means. Understand what the businesses that you have in your portfolio do, how they make their money, what they're trying to achieve as businesses. Know the business. Don't know the names, don't memorize the tickets, know what the businesses are and what they do. I will say to you right now, if you can't tell me in 30 seconds what every company in your portfolio does, clearly, to my satisfaction and yours, you have no business owning that stock. Not because it's a bad company. Not because it won't go up. Those things are very possibly true. As an investor, if you don't know what it does, why the hell have you got your money invested in that asset? Because your caddy told you? Because your best mate told you? Because you heard it at a barbecue? Because someone said it on hot copper? Knock yourself out. But you have no business owning those companies unless you know what they do and know that you know. Don't look it up. Don't give me some, oh, they sell stuff. They're in the mining business. They're a tech company. Know what they do. Here's why. Firstly, if you have enough conviction to put your hard-earned money in that stock, you owe it to yourself to have a conviction about the business. You owe it to yourself. That's the first thing. The second thing is when times get tough, like right now, what are you going to do when the share price falls? If you know that you know that you know the business, and you've probably got a reason for owning that business that is not just because my best mate, Tabby, mate down the path, girl at work, told me to buy it. But I understand the business, I know what it does, I know how it makes its money. You're far less likely to get scared out of that stock at exactly the wrong time. Because there is no time it's going to freak you out like, oh, it's down 50%, I don't even know what it does, what idiot, why did I do that? Too late by then. You've lost your money. So know what it does, know what it does, know what it does. Second thing is related, the third thing, know why you own it. It's not the same thing. What are you expecting from the company? What was the investment thesis behind your choice? When you bought those shares, I bought these shares because I'm expecting the company to, and I think the price is. You should be able to answer those questions for yourself. Quite 
getting very preachy. I haven't yelled for the noise. I apologize because it's coming across a bit preachy, but I'm loving it. I'm, I'm living the thing. Um, if you can answer those questions, again, you are much less likely to sell when things go bad. I own Woolies because it's a defensive supermarket investment and the business is pretty sound. But, I don't know, by the way, I'll tell you if I own anything on the slide that I'll go. I own Fortescue Iron, I own Fortescue, because I expect dot, 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 it does this, it's going to do that, and I think the price is, in my case, Fortescue, when I bought it, cheap relative to the value of the organization, and the iron ore price was low, this is eight months ago. You've got to know the answer to those questions and know that you know them. Again, don't try and come up with it afterwards. Andrew Page, a former colleague of mine, a guy I do a podcast with, said you can't borrow conviction. And it's true. And where's your conviction going to be tested? When share prices fall. When share prices go up, we're all geniuses, right? We're all, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> How good's my stock picking? I'm so good at that. My good question is for a job. Right? So easy to be confident when the share prices go up. I knew that was going to happen. How clever am I? When they plateau? No, oh, it's okay. I'm, I, I, I'm sure it will eventually. And when it starts to fall, oh my God, I'm an idiot. What have I done? Or, more importantly, if you're a volunteer core member, bloody Phillips, what have you done with my shares? How, 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 how did you know the share price was going to fall? What's wrong with it? Now, that's my job. That's my cost to bear. It's not yours. But if you don't know why you own the shares you own, when the hard times come, that is the time your conviction is going to be tested. And if you don't have any, you're probably going to sell. Now, you absolutely should sell if your conviction is busted. If you bought shares that you thought, if, if I buy shares because I think Woolies going to go into Bitcoin mining, and it turns out they didn't, probably time to sell. Now, if I bought a Bitcoin mine and they went to supermarket retailing, probably also time to sell. Right? So, Know what you bought, know why you bought it, know what you're expecting. I expect the business to do X. I will share a company, I'll share a Motley Fool member, by the way. Any hands? Good. I'll get away with this one then. I recommend the cheap Kogan at $6 and $9. They're now about $3 and change. I'm not very popular sometimes with our members. But I recommended Kogan because I think over five plus years, they will grow sales at a compound rate of 15 or 20 cents a year, and that in that period of time, they'll turn it into profitable growth. Now, we're about years two and a half or three right now. I can still be dramatically wrong. The shares are falling through the floor. I own shares, by the way. Shares are falling through the floor. Am I wrong? Maybe. Am I right? Maybe. I can't know yet. All I can tell you about COVID is what they've done and what the market thinks. Neither of those two things, in and of themselves, are grounds for selling the shares or for buying more, by the way. Is COVID cheap because it's fallen by two thirds? I'm hoping it goes broke tomorrow. Is it cheap because it falls by two thirds and it's much bigger in five years' time? Absolutely. I can't know that right now. Just because it's fallen, not a reason to buy shares. Just because it's fallen, not a reason to sell shares. Because I don't know what happens next. If COVID goes on to quadruple in size and profits come through the floor, come through the door, not through the floor, through the door. The share price will go back up over time, and I will be justified in that recommendation and buying the shares for myself. If they don't, I look like an idiot, justifiably so, and I was wrong. But the share price movement on COVID is not an excuse or a reason in and of itself to sell shares. Anyone heard of Enron here? Enron was the famous fraud in the US. Energy trading company? Absolute fraud. It had a basis that was kind of something related to what it said it did. The rest of it was fraud. Okay? Those shares went up, and up, and up, and up, and up. And the market said, this is a wonderful business. You really should be buying some shares. I don't need to ask you the rhetorical question. Was it really worth buying more just because the shares were up? Of course not. Was the market right because the shares were up? Of course not. But if you're buying or selling shares because the market's telling you, you're making a mistake. Here's why. If I buy shares tomorrow in CHP, I'm buying those shares because I think those shares are going to deliver me a better return than I can get elsewhere. I think stocks for a living. I say to my members all the time, if you don't think I can beat the market, or if I can't beat the market, leave and buy an ETF. You can get a spectacular compound result from an ETF. All you need to do, all anyone needs to do, 
Now, my boss doesn't love me saying that, but he doesn't mind me saying that because it's true. If I can't add value, don't pay my bills. Well, pay bills, you already own the bills, but that's a different question. Don't stay with me. Go and invest in ETF. Why stay with me and make what money you can make somewhere else? Now, let's follow that through. If that's true, if I buy shares at BHP, I should only buy those shares if I think BHP's potential return is better than an ETF. Why? Because otherwise you buy the ETF. So, one, two. Now, if I buy shares in BHP because I think it's going to beat the market, I'm by definition saying the market is wrong. It is currently undervaluing BHP's shares. Yeah, we all still with me? Now, if those shares are undervalued, that's because the market thinks I'm wrong, because I'm buying them today. At today's price, it's saying, you're wrong, Mr. Market. I think these shares are too cheap. So I do that. Then I wake up, not tomorrow morning, Monday morning. Check the share price, 10 minutes past 10. Shares are down 2%. Oh, my God, I'm an idiot. Oh, I was wrong. I've lost money. A week later, they are 5%. Oh, I'm an idiot. Oh, I've lost money. Oh, what, what a mistake I made. A year later, they're down 20%. Oh, God, I screwed this up. I'll stop now. I'm not a good actor. You buy shares because you think the market's wrong, but then as soon as you buy them, you ask the market what it thinks. How mad is that? Think that through. You buy shares that you think are cheap, and then you ask the market tomorrow, what are they worth? The market was wrong yesterday, but it's right today. Just that it just bought the shares? Seriously? Now, I'm seeing plenty about it. We all do, I do it too. I hate losing money when I buy shares. I'd much rather them go up. But if you think the market's wrong now, do you reckon it's going to change its mind tomorrow just because you buy the shares? Of course it's not. Logically, it makes no sense. Now, we're all human. I'm not saying, don't worry about it, don't feel like that. You're going to feel like that. So here's the next tip is separate your emotions from your decision-making. Now, easy, right? Easy to say. It's okay to feel those emotions. It's natural to feel those emotions. You will feel those emotions. I feel those emotions. I've been doing this for 25 years. I hate losing money. When I buy shares, the share price falls. Like, oh, God, I'm an idiot. When I see the market go up a little bit, I think, oh, maybe it's going to keep going. I better buy now. Or when it falls down, I go, maybe I better buy something for the shares fall further. Or whatever else happens. Okay? That, that process, it, it just, it's, it's winding up, right? Humanity is hundreds of thousands of years old. Investing is 120 years old on the world's stock market. Our revolutionary brains are still stuck back on the savannas, right? We are not geared for this. Now, the great thing about that is you can master it, you get a chance to beat the market because no one else's brain is ready for this either. But if you can separate out the reality of what the market thinks, and what you think, and then follow that through, that is the advantage for the individual investor who can master not the emotion, but your response to the emotion. You will never master your emotion to the degree you need to. It won't happen. If you've already geared that way, congratulations, by the way. Our lifespans are too short. Evolution is too long. All you can do is manage that response that you have and not react to it with your actions. Feel the pain and then leave it alone. Hard to do. You're going to have to practice it. We all still feel it. I've been investing for 25 years. The dot-com crash, the GFC, the COVID crash, and the current, whatever the stuff's going to look like by the time it I have no idea how this nets out. But I will tell you that during the COVID crash, I hated investing. Hated it. I was telling my members buy shares. And the market fell 38% in a month and four days. 38% in one month and four days. Biggest crash, fastest crash ever. I was saying buy shares. Members hated it. I hated it. My, my portfolio was getting smashed. Absolutely smashed. Now, we're supposed to think, if you read the textbooks, that's a great opportunity. I'm going to go and buy. Didn't feel like that. Felt scary as hell. What if the market keeps falling? What if this is the end of the world? What if capitalism is somehow crushed by this? What if we don't respond to the cover? What if we're stuck with COVID and we're in our homes for the next 10 years? Those are the things that go through people's minds at the time, right? Scary, scary time. Do you know what it is? I invested anyway. Not because it felt good, not because I'm superhuman, 
Not because I controlled my emotions. I didn't feel any that fear at all. I had no deep moment going on. If you do, good luck to you. That's great. I did it because I knew it was the right thing to do. That was it. I had decided as an investor that I will take the long-term approach to investing and I will keep investing anyway. And that was literally it. There was no great foresight. There was no sense that I felt better than everybody else. <coughs> that I didn't care or I wasn't worried or I didn't want people. I did it because history tells us it's the right thing to do. And that's why I'm about separating the emotional side of your brain <coughs> from the pragmatic or decision-making side of your brain. And simply choosing to say, I know how this game works, I know how it's played, and I'm going to do it anyway. For the last 11 years, I've worked for the Baltimore School, almost 12 years. Every one of those years, someone said, uh -huh, but this time it's different. You know what? It never is. I might have it always is. We haven't had COVID for a big pandemic for 100 years. That was different. But if it wasn't that, it would have been something else. Most of those something else don't come true, by the way. People have been telling me the dollar's going to collapse for 12 years. Doesn't happen, not going to happen, won't happen. Right? Volatility will absolutely happen. This clump I didn't predict, the next one I won't predict, the one after I won't predict. Here's the next trick be an optimist. Be an optimist. Not because it's naive, not because it's Pollyanna, not because I want to believe that everything's okay and there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. Be an optimist because optimism works because democratic capitalism works. Not perfectly. I would change a whole lot of stuff about democratic capitalism, given the choice. But it works. It works for a decade. It's worked for a century. It's worked for multiple centuries. Stock market, 120, 130 years old. The, underpin, the fundamental underpinnings of democratic capitalism work. Over the last 120 years, I told you at the beginning, the stock market gained 6.1% in Australia after inflation. You don't see after inflation numbers under the credit Swiss study, by the way. Uh, 6.1% after inflation, over 120 something years. Over the last 30 years, the Australian stock market, 10 to 130 grand, I told you about earlier, 9.0 per cent per year. Despite everything I just told you, everything had gone wrong over that 30 year period. The market goes up despite not in the absence of actual and imagined problems. That's what it does. Not in a straight line. By the way, the further you zoom out, the straighter that line gets. I think anyone in this room is old enough to remember the 87 crash from the look of it. The 1987 crash was the biggest single day crash in history in the US. If you look at that now on a share market graph, that goes from here at the bottom left, I'll go your way, here at the bottom left, to here at the top right. The 87 crash is that big down here. 20% in a day, I think, for a week. 987. We have stockbrokers tragically jumping out of windows. This is like a huge, huge, huge deal. Huge deal. At the bottom of the graph, is that big. Optimism wins because democratic capitalism wins. It's the way it works. The profit motive, the ability for us all to work together, the system of government we have, the society that we have built in the largely Western world, but increasingly the developing world as well, works. Imperfectly, you change a lot of stuff, I change a lot of stuff. But it works. It creates value because companies find ways to meet our needs and wants. And by the way, to create some wants we didn't know we had. But it works. And so if you're going to bet against that, go home, don't be here. But if you are here, you're here because you fundamentally, whether you recognize it or not, agree and believe that the long-term future for the stock market is bright. Because the long-term future for humanity is bright. I think people ask me a lot, is now a good time to invest? My answer is yes. My answer was yes a week ago, three weeks ago, three months ago, six months ago, 18 months ago. Text talks about a lot since then. Was I wrong? Well, if you measure over eight months, sure. If you measure over five years, 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, I am spectacularly right. Because the market goes up over time. The longer you wait to invest, mathematically, the harder you're going to find it to make back the money that you forgo while you wait for the next dip. Dips happen. Now, 
If you waited for the last 18 months and said, I know a gift's coming, you bet it today, you think you're a genius. And good luck to you if you've done that. Fantastic. More often than not, if you wait 18 months at any point in time to invest, you're giving up 10 to 15% on average by doing that. The money you give up while you're waiting is almost never made back by the gift that then follows. So many investors give up 5, 10, 15, 20 percent gains waiting for a 5 percent dip. I'll wait till share prices fall, they say. Well, the price got 100 or 103, 107, 110, 120, 130, drop 5 percent. What's that? 114, 24. They didn't buy. I got a bargain. I waited. I waited for that dip. See how much I saved by waiting? They cost themselves 24 percent of the way through. That is why it's important to understand the forces that are working in our favor as investors. Not only at the company level, but at the total market level. So, tips and tricks to invest in this market. Mentally, disconnect yourself from where the market's been in the last little while, or where it's going in the next little while. I don't know and you don't know. There are two people who make predictions. Those who are lying to you, and those who are lying to themselves. There's no other way to know. I don't know where the market's going next week or next year. What am I doing? I'm investing anyway. Why? Because the story of human endeavor, the power of democratic capitalism, and the story of the stock market is one of massive, massive compound growth. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. That was fantastic. And I think it's really calm. <laughs> I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.